maybe we'll get started so uh, let me introduce first namaste to one and all it's indeed my proud privilege as well as honor to welcome the speaker of the day professor mathukumalli vidya sagar frs for this first ever institute lecture of this semester before i have the privilege of introducing the speaker formally to our audience uh, let me speak a few sentences about this venture of institute lecture series that we have this is which is an otherwise offline event which we conduct once a month when the semester is running wherein we invite highly accomplished public intellectuals from various disciplines of science technology arts administration as well in order to interact with our students and faculty members across all the departments of our institute this is primarily to showcase the excellence that our speakers have achieved as well as to inculcate interdisciplinary cross disciplinary intellectual thinking amongst both our students as well as faculty members so it is this the brief introduction of this lecture series that we have had and we have had the honor of hosting uh, professors like professor gautam desi raju in the past and professor md shrinivas talking on various topics of their interest to our faculty members and students so today we have as i said the pleasure and honor of uh, listening to professor m vidya sagar a control theorist of international repute who needs no introduction but since decorum demands that i formally introduce him and here i have that pleasure he hails from uh, guntur andhra pradesh and like india this is also the year of his amrit mahotsav where he has turned he'll be turning 75 soon he had his undergraduate masters as well as phd in electrical engineering from the university of wisconsin madison in the years 65 67 and 69 respectively during his 50 plus year career he has been an academic founder of a government r&d lab and an industrial r&d lab and again an academic he is a leading control theorist of international repute at present he is the science and engineering research board national science chair at iit hyderabad previously he was the cecil and ida green the second chair of systems biology science at the university of texas at dallas prior to that he was an executive vice president at the tata consultancy services where he headed the advanced technology center earlier he was the director of the center of artificial intelligence and robotics a drdo defense lab in uh, bengaluru and in that context uh, i wish to just which was shared very recently in the social media where dr giridhar girish devdhar who is currently the director of the ada and how he has uh, gone public in showing how professor vidya sagar was instrumental in getting dr girish to work on lca as light combat aircraft when professor vidya sagar was the director so this goes on to say how meticulously he was also an institution builder he currently along with uh, professor manindra agarwal of iit kanpur and uh, uh, m kanitkar leads the sutra team which mathematically models the covid 19 pandemic in our country professor vidya sagar has received a number of national and international awards in recognition of his research including fellowship of the royal society and the ieee control systems award beyond academics professor vidya sagar is a seasoned connoisseur of carnatic classical music and an avid reader of classics in various languages without much ado i now invite professor vidya sagar to talk to us 
on this topic that he has chosen, Modeling COVID-19 in India and Elsewhere, the Sutra. Professor Vidya Sakha. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramanathan. <clears throat> I'm happy to be giving this uh, institute lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you can um, uh, ask them in the chat box, and I leave it to the organizers to decide whether they want to interrupt me or wait until the end. I do not mind if people want to interrupt me while I'm talking. Okay. So as uh, has been mentioned, uh, the Sutra model is developed by three of us. This is Professor Manindra Agrawal of IIT Kanpur, who is himself an extremely renowned researcher, uh, well known, for example, for showing that the primality of a number can be tested in polynomial time. Uh, this is Lieutenant General Madhuri Kanitkar. At the moment, she is the Deputy Chief for Medical Services in the Integrated Defense Staff. Uh, she is going to, on October 1st or very shortly thereafter, she is going to become the Vice Chancellor of the Maharashtra University of Health Sciences. So she is just basically transitioning. So the three of us have worked on this, and what I'm going to do is to tell you about this in the next hour or so. So this is an outline of the lecture. We'll be seeing the slide again and again. So let's start with one of the most catastrophic documented pandemic. It's not that there were no pandemics before the Spanish flu, but record keeping was very poor. So we don't really know how many people actually died. So for example, the so-called Black Death, which was the bubonic plague pandemic of the early 14th century, uh, there are all kinds of wild estimates that one out of three people died and all that, but there is no record as such. So the Spanish flu is perhaps the first uh, large worldwide pandemic in which uh, they were reasonably accurate records. And you can see there was a small bump. Uh, I don't know exactly the vertical scale, but I'm guessing that this is in the tens of thousands per week. Okay, because I got it off a website. So you can see that World War I was still going on when the pandemic first started. World War I ended in November of 1918, which is around there. And the peak ended and looked like the pandemic went away. Then at the end of 1918, the start of 1919, the cases simply just shot up. And at the peak of the pandemic, about there, it is well known that around 45 to 50,000 people were dying every single week. And since the world population at that time was about one third of what it is today, that is like um, about 150,000 people dying every week today. So approximately 20,000 people dying every single day, which is about two, two and a half times more than the peak for Corona, uh, for the uh, coronavirus that we have today. So relative to the population of the world, Spanish flu was extremely uh, devastating. Then it also decayed, and then after 1919 ended and 1920 started, there was the second peak, pardon me, there was a third peak, which was not as high as the second peak, but higher than the first. Now remember back then there was no genomics, nothing. So uh, people didn't have a full explanation for this. So let me start with previous models, specifically the early models. And the very first model uh, is called SIR. So S stands for susceptible, I stands for infected, and R stands for removed. Now, if you read the literature, a lot of times R is supposed to stand for recovered, but uh, I don't like that uh, phrase. I would rather call it removed because whether a person recovers or dies, uh, he's not going to be infected again. So I much prefer it removed. And these are all fractions. So they are numbers, between, real numbers between 0 and 1. And this model was proposed in 1927 by Kermack and McKendrick, so 94 years ago. And ironically, uh, this model was proposed because they were trying to analyze the spread of the bubonic plague in the city of Pune. So what are the premises of this model? They claim that the rate of spread of the disease is proportional to the number of contacts between the S and I groups. So if a person in I comes in contact with a person in S, 
then in, an infection will result at a particular rate. And people who recovered are not liable for reinfection. So if some people in R, in fact, lose their immunity, then and become liable for infection again, this is known as the SIRS model. So you can always use the SIR model in a short term, because even if people lose immunity, it takes some time. But if you want to model long-term disease, then you should make a distinction between whether the disease confers lifelong immunity, like smallpox, for example, or if the immunity fades, like flu, which gives you about six, eight months immunity, then you should use the SIRS model. So here's a very simple flowchart of the SIR model. So this box contains a susceptible individual, and this box contains the infected individual. So when an infected person comes in contact with a susceptible person, then with a probability of beta, a fresh infection takes place. So the infected person enters this box I, and then at a certain rate, gamma, the people recover and enter this box R for removal. So this gives you three differential equations. S dot is equal to minus beta I S. What I mentioned that when I people meet S people with a certain rate of beta, the infection takes place. So this people are subtracted from the S bucket and added to the I bucket. Now, once the people in the I bucket spend some time, they recover. So this arrow shows that at a rate of gamma I, they go out of the I bucket and get added to the R bucket. If on the other hand, some people in the R bucket lose their immunity and get back to being susceptible again, which is what I have shown as this red arrow. And if theta is the rate at which uh, recovered people uh, lose their immunity, then you see that we have an extra term plus theta r replenishing s and a term minus theta r subtracting r. So let's look at the details of this model. So there are three differential equations as you have seen, s dot equals minus beta i s, i dot equals beta i s minus gamma i, and r dot equals gamma i. So beta is usually called the contact rate and gamma is called the recovery rate. I should actually call it the removal rate, but somehow recovery rate is standard. And just to remind you that these are fractions. Uh, so beta is the likelihood of an infection. And one over gamma is the average time that a person spends in the hospital to recover or very rarely die. Now, if you just add up these three equations, you can see that S S dot plus I dot plus R dot equals um, zero, which means that the sum remains constant. And initially, these fractions add up to one. So that means that they equal one at all future times. So you really have only two independent equations. You don't really need three equations. So most people throw away the R equation and just focus only on the S and the I equations. So what are the dynamics? So typically, when uh, the model starts at time zero, practically everybody is susceptible. I of zero is very small, but not zero, because if there are no infected people, then the um, pandemic will not start at all. And R of zero is exactly equal to zero because there are no recovered people at the start. Uh, and the key parameter of this model is called R naught, beta divided by gamma, and this is called the basic reproduction ratio. And you can think about this as the average number of persons that an infected individual infects before he himself recovers. And the significance of R0 is that if R0 is less than one, then I, the number of infected people, from this very small initial value decays monotonically to zero, and therefore there is no pandemic. If the basic reproduction ratio is greater than one, then initially I will increase from this very small value, and then it hits a peak when I dot is equal to zero. And that happens when S is equal to one divided by R naught, and I plus R 
equals 1 minus this term because remember s plus i plus r is always equal to 1. So if s equals this, then i plus r equals r0 minus 1 divided by r0. This is the so-called herd immunity ratio. Now, if you are wondering where this mysterious formula comes from, it's very easy. Go back to this equation. When is i maximum? Basic calculus says i is maximum when i dot equals 0. So set the right hand side equal to 0. Cancel i. And that tells you that s is equal to uh, gamma divided by beta, which is exactly 1 over r0. Okay. So what you can see is the pandemic will increase until such a time as the total number of people who are currently infected plus those who were previously infected adds up to this herd immunity ratio H. And I should tell you something interesting. The phrase herd immunity is very old. When I was reading the literature on this, I was quite amused to find that the phrase herd immunity was introduced in 1921 or something before the SIR model. But this particular formula was derived 50 years later in the, in the 1970s. So for example, if a basic reproduction ratio equals four, and I'm choosing four deliberately because for the current Delta variant that we have in India, R0 is approximately four. So what fraction of the people need to be either infected now or previously infected before the pandemic peaks? Well, you just plug it into this formula and you get three divided by four, which is 70.75 or 75%. So in the case of the SIRS model, something different happens. In the SIR model, I mentioned that once the number of susceptible people hits this, the infections go down and eventually infections completely disappear at time infinity i is equal to zero no infection everybody is either in s or in r and there's a very uh, simple equation that relates the value of s at time infinity to the value of r at infinity it's a transcendental equation so you cannot solve it easily but you can solve it numerically of course and the higher R0 is, fewer people are in S infinity and more are going to be in R infinity. But interestingly, if you have the SIRS model, where some people in the S bucket, uh, pardon me, some people in the R bucket re-enter the S bucket, then the disease becomes endemic. So the infection never dies down. And therefore, the disease will manifest a cyclic behavior it will seem to be reducing, but then go back up again, and then reduce and go back up again. And this is known as uh, the endemic behavior or cyclical behavior. So just one slide on something called SEIRS. I don't even have a picture for this. It's not worthwhile. Some people introduce one more um, entry here called E for exposed. So what their idea is that when somebody who's infected contact somebody who is susceptible, they don't become infected right away. They go into this intermediate box called exposed. And the fundamental premise here is that when a person is in the exposed state and meets a susceptible person, it does not lead to new infection. Only contact between S and I lead to new infections. And just like in the SIR model, if some of the people who have recovered lose their immunity, then instead of SEIR, you have SEIRS model. So I won't be spending any time on this. Now, I'm going to talk next about something that is very germane to the coronavirus called SAIR model. So now you may say, wait a minute, all you have done is to change the letter E to the letter A. No, it's not true. The equations are fundamentally different, as I will try to convince you. So the main difference between the coronavirus and the previous infectious diseases is that COVID is characterized by a large number of asymptomatic patients. So these carriers do not manifest any symptoms, and oftentimes they themselves don't know that they are infected. But they're still shedding the virus, and therefore they can infect others. 
So about a year and a half ago, when coronavirus first hit, uh, researchers did some very careful experiments to see how much virus an asymptomatic patient sheds compared to a person who has visible symptoms, and they found that it seems to be about 80% of the viral load. Similarly, for how long do they shed? It turns out that on average, an infectious person is dispelling the virus for about 10 days, and the asymptomatic people are doing so for about eight days. So for all practical purposes, you can ignore those distinctions and just assume that the rate of viral shedding and the duration of viral shedding is the same for both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. Now, the thing is, if you want to make an accurate prediction for the number of cases, you have to have a way of estimating how many asymptomatic patients there are. And if you read the literature, uh, you will find that initial estimates, talking about March, April of 2020, people were saying that the number of asymptomatic patients is roughly the same as the number of symptomatic patients and so on. And these estimates kept getting higher and higher and higher. And you will see finally when I get to that part of our model that we think that the number of undetected patients is something like 32 times the number of detected patients. Okay, but it took pe time for people to get used to this idea. So how do we capture this in a mathematical model? The first paper that I'm aware of is in the year 2013, due to a couple of uh, researchers in the US, Robinson and Stillian Arkins. And what they do is to divide the people who are carrying the virus into two groups, the asymptomatic people and the infected group. Okay. The reason why they did not call them symptomatic is because then you would have to use the letter S, and S is already used for susceptible. So they decided to go with I. Very, very pragmatic reason. So the idea is that a contact between a susceptible person and either an A person or an I person leads to the person in S becoming infected. And they also allowed for the possibility that the rate of infection is different. They assume that everybody who gets infected becomes initially asymptomatic. And then later on, some people become infected. That means they show symptoms. But others directly go from the A box to the R box. And the people who are infected eventually recover. So here's a picture to fix all these ideas. Here is the bucket A of asymptomatic people. And these are the susceptible people. These are the infected people. So if A and S come together, <coughs> the infection rate is beta A. If I and S come together, the infection rate is beta I. From the box A, at a certain rate delta, they move into this I bucket, which means they actually begin to show symptoms. With some other rate gamma sub A, they directly recover. And the infected people recover or get removed at a certain rate gamma sub I. So there is no assumption that these two numbers are the same and there is no assumption that these two numbers are the same. So the underlying premise of the SAIR model is that everybody who is infected will be known to the authority. So the number I can be measured, and the, all the patients in A escape observation. Okay, now I did not bother writing down the equations uh, for the SAIR model. It's fairly obvious from this picture. Uh, I just wanted to save a bit of time. So now, when um, Professor Agrawal, General Kanitkar, and I started working on this problem, we discovered something very fast, which is that from this SAIR model, remember, you can measure I because you can see how many people are testing positive, and you can measure R because you can tell the rate at which people are recovering. You have no way of measuring A because that's the premise here. And we discovered that mathematically it is possible to estimate delta from the available data. But this is what is called in mathematics as an ill-posed problem, which means that your estimates of delta are very, very unreliable. It's a numerically unstable problem. So we found that, okay, this is not the way to go. 
So then we came out with another variant that we call the SAIR2 model and we published this in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. And the main advantage of this model over the SAIR model that I showed earlier is that it's very easy to calibrate. And we use this to analyze India's first wave. And one of the things we did using this model was that we quantified the impact of the first lockdown. If you recall, India went into a lockdown on March 24th or something like that, 2020. And there were a lot of questions. Was this lockdown really necessary? Uh, how many cases did it save? How many deaths did it save? And we were able to quantify the impact. And we could also call the, the peak of the first wave. We said that it would occur in mid-September 2020, and indeed it happened. So that's the good news. The bad news is our method of calibrating the model works only when S is approximately 1. So that means only at the start of the pandemic. Uh, once the pandemic has been underway for a few months, if the characteristics change, we had really no way of calibrating it. The other weakness of this SIR2 model was that it did not have a realistic provision for asymptomatic patients crossing over into the symptomatic category. So here is uh, the prediction we made using this SIR2 model. Uh, this seems like ancient history, but at the time it was big news. Okay. So the this gold colored curve is what we predicted uh, using the SIR2 model. We predicted a peak, you can see around 6th of September. The, the sort of a blue color, light blue, is what actually happened. The numbers don't match exactly, but the peak matches reasonably well. More interesting are these other curves. It's very difficult to see because the letters are very small. I apologize for that. But this red curve, that one there, is what would have happened if there had been no lockdown. Okay. So what actually happened was that we had active cases peaking in middle of September at about 10 lakhs. Our computation was that if there had been no lockdown, the peak would have occurred towards the end of May. Can you see that? And the peak would have been around 47 lakhs, not 10 lakhs. So the, it would have been completely overwhelmed. It would have completely overwhelmed uh, our healthcare system, but for the lockdown. So this was our first success. But then because of these two limitations, we kept working. And then we came out with this new model that we call Sutra. So the idea here is that the way in which the pandemic is evolving in India, some of the assumptions made by Robinson and Stelianakis in their model do not hold. In particular, if you recall, their basic assumption was everybody who is in the I bucket gets detected, and everybody who is in the A, asymptomatic bucket, escape detection. But that's not true. What happened in, uh, in the early days of our pandemic was most people who are showing symptoms, they get detected because they test positive or they're coughing or something like that. Many, if not most, are isolated and they don't pass on the disease. Some may be put in hospital, others are told to stay at home, but then to avoid contact with family members. <coughs> so the idea that people in I, this bucket, are infecting others did not always hold true. Much more important is this one. The premise in the SAIR model was that every asymptomatic person escapes detection. But this is not true because we, like most other countries in the world, we started contact tracing. So if some person tests positive, you immediately test the family members. If some of them test, po test positive, then you test the neighbor, the vegetable vendor. The, if they're living in a housing colony, you test the watchman. So what happens is that due to, the, due, due to the contact tracing, a lot of people are tested positive. And interestingly, the vast majority of them are asymptomatic. Okay. 
So now, please make sure that you see the implication in the correct direction. During the first wave and the second wave of the coronavirus, of the people who tested positive, about 80% were asymptomatic. But that did not mean that there weren't still others out there who were also asymptomatic and were not detected. So we decided that the correct division is not between A and I, asymptomatic versus infected, but between T, those who test positive, and U, who are undetected. Among those who test positive, as I mentioned, about 80% are asymptomatic and recover. U, the undetected but infected people, obviously by definition they are asymptomatic, so almost everybody in U recovers. So once you make this kind of a regrouping of the patient, you come out with this model. So here, S stands for susceptible, U stands for undetected, T stands for tested positive, and R stands for recovered. So A stands for analysis, all right? Susceptible, undetected, tested positive, recovered analysis. That's why we call it Sutra. So what happens to the people in the S bucket? If they meet somebody in the U bucket, at a certain rate of beta, they enter the U bucket. That means this is where the primary infection is taking place. With some rate epsilon, the recently infected people become symptomatic. Notice that there is no arrow here. There is no arrow. The assumption is that most people who test positive isolate themselves. This is not entirely true, but it is reasonably close to being true. And the thing is that whether the person tests positive or is undetected, they all recover or get removed. We made another assumption that the rate of removal is the same for both groupings, and this is pretty much true. The reason is, if you test positive, your case fatality ratio is about one and a half percent in India, one and a half to one point one point two to one point five percent. So ninety-eight and a half percent recover, one point five percent die. Let's say, if you are undetected to begin with, then hundred percent recover, and the rate of uh, recovery is pretty much the same in both cases. It's approximately ten days. So gamma is you can say one over ten. So now the equations look like this. S dot equals beta ratio, that this thing here. U dot is equal to, uh, sorry, there's a typo. This is S dot equals minus beta SU. I'm sorry about that. Okay, if you remember earlier equation, there was a minus sign here because these people are getting subtracted from the S buckets. I'll fix that later. Okay, so U dot, uh, you can see, is a, uh, plus beta SU because they are entering here, minus epsilon beta SU, which is that decay, minus gamma U, which is this decay. And T dot is equal to epsilon beta SU, that is the inflow, minus gamma T, and R dot U equals gamma U, R dot T equals gamma T. So now there are two parameters here. One is this epsilon, which is the rate at which people go from this bucket to that bucket. And we have been able to show that with this model, the ratio between U plus T to T remains constant over time, assuming epsilon is constant. So therefore, we call this number epsilon as the undetection rate. And therefore, one over epsilon is the ratio between the total number of people undetected plus tested to just those who tested. So one over epsilon minus one is the ratio between U and T, you can see that. Now there's one more parameter which doesn't show up in these equations. It's called the reach rho, and it is pretty much what the name implies. Now one of the challenges in calibrating a model like this is that you have to go from raw cases to fractions. See, all these equations here, Everything is a number between 0 and 1. But you don't get that data. What you get is uh, so many people got sick yesterday, so many people died, so many people discharged. 
you get case counts which are integers. So how do you convert them to pop fractions of the population? So you say, ah, that's obvious. You just take the number of cases divided by the underlying population. But what is the underlying population? It's not that obvious. This is where the concept of the reach comes in. It is the fraction of the total population that is exposed to the disease. So it starts at zero and increases towards one. And this is what I was saying uh, uh, in the last slide, that the ratio one over epsilon is the ratio of u plus t to t. So u over t is one over epsilon minus one. So for example, for the Indian pandemic, at the moment we feel one over epsilon is 33. That means that for every person who is detected positive, there are 32 others who are undetected. Now the SAIR2 model had epsilon, but it didn't have rho. And this is a crucial difference because it allows us to track the changes in the pandemic and recalibrate it at any point in the pandemic, not just at the start. So it turns out that, so we, we right off the bat, we said we need ways of estimating parameters that are robust. So that was our goal. So it turns out, if you read our paper, you will find out that if you make a nonlinear transformation of the data, then there is a re linear relationship between two quantities. So T is the raw tested positive cases. So this is an integer. R of T is the raw recovered cases, including deaths or removed cases. And we chose a window of seven just to smoothen out, just a moving window so that the, the daily numbers are jumping. So this kind of smooths them out. So the, this is one quantity. And you see it's a linear in the data T integral minus t plus rt integral. And b is a constant to be determined. That's what I said here. That is one of the quantity. What is the other quantity? The other quantity is 1 over p0, which is the total population, and integral from t minus 7 days to t of, and here's where the nonlinearity comes in. You take t plus rt multiplied by t. Okay, So this is clearly a nonlinear function of the data. And we can show that these two quantities satisfy linear relationship after an initial transient period. So when the data fails to satisfy this linear relationship, that's when we recalibrate. So here's a picture showing what I'm talking about. This is for Italy. I think for Italy, we had seven or eight phases. So basically the numbers start there and they keep going down, down, down. And there's a straight line going through the origin. Okay? And if you look at the R squared value, I think people understand what the R squared value is. It tells you what amount of the variation in the data is adequately explained by your straight line fit. It's practically equal to one. So you can see data lies directly on the straight line and it begins to deviate a little bit. And now it is beginning to deviate a lot. And then you say, okay, that means time to start a new phase. Starting a new phase means what? You change this constant P and you also have to do the calculation of a row. Okay. Now, why do we need a phase change? So one of the comments that people always make is, now why are you changing our parameters? You must take one set of parameters and use it throughout. Well, I mean, the pandemic is now 18 months old. It is extremely naive to think that the parameters of the pandemic are the same. They have not changed at all. In fact, they change over time, either gradually or abruptly. For example, if people start disregarding COVID protocols, then beta will increase because contacts go up and likelihood of infection goes up. Or uh, in the early part of this year, the Delta variant came and it just swept through the country. So which means with the same amount of contact between people, the likelihood of infection went way up. So that is a slow increase in beta. Now, suppose a non-pharmaceutical intervention, like a lockdown is imposed, then beta will decrease suddenly. From yesterday to today, it changes dramatically. And the so-called reach of the pandemic also increases 
because at the start of the pandemic, uh, usually only one part of the country is exposed. Then as the sp pandemic spread, every part of the country gets exposed. But even within a city like say Hyderabad or Mumbai, for example, what happens is that initially there are protected bubbles, like gated communities, where the pandemic does not reach. But then when they also get penetrated and fall within the reach of the virus, then row goes up. A dramatic example of this was in Mumbai, where in the first wave, it was mostly the, uh, the slum areas that were infected and the gated communities were protected. Then in the second wave, uh, the gated communities also got penetrated, which is why the tolls were very high. So the point I'm trying to make is you have to recalibrate the model. And how do you know when to recalibrate the model? When the data start drifting away from the straight line. So the point is, we have a systematic procedure for determining when you need to recalibrate. We do not do this arbitrarily. Now, the next uh, improvement that we made recently, I'm going to dismiss it in one slide, even though it's actually uh, quite an interesting piece of work, mainly so that uh, I can finish in time. So suppose you want to incorporate um, the impact of vaccination. So at a particular point in time, we mention a fraction L. Now this is not a constant, it's a function of time. I have not shown it for simplicity. So it means that suppose a person is infected today and recovers, then that person will have immunity from reinfection for a certain period of time. But it is not constant. As time goes on, the immunity wanes. So this fraction L that lose immunity initially is zero and eventually it goes up. Right now it looks like uh, L never goes beyond about 0.15 to 0.2, which means that looks like about 80, 85% of the people who are infected have long-term immunity. But like with so many things in Corona, this is always subject to adjustment and we keep reading the literature to see what these numbers are. But we are not bothered about that right now. So suppose L is this number of the fraction of people who have lost immunity at a particular time. And similarly, we put this number V, which is a fraction of the population that has been uh, vaccinated. Now here, obviously, you have to put in one dose vaccination or two doses. And we just simply do this by saying, typically, if you take one shot, you get a certain level of immunity. And if you take the second shot, you get a higher level of immunity. And uh, in the model, we go into great detail, but here I've just said, suppose there's some sort of a blended average of the population that have gained immunity due to vaccination. So you've got two things going against each other. Passage of time means that those who were previously infected and are not vaccinated lose immunity. And vaccination means that people who are vaccinated gain immunity. So it turns out we can show that in the Sutra equation, mathematically, this is equivalent to replacing the contact rate beta by this number, one plus L minus V divided by rho, where rho is the reach. And remember, everything is a function of time, though I have not shown it here. And similarly, the underlying population gets replaced by the same factor, one plus L minus V divided by rho into P0. Now look at this formula. What does it tell you? It tells you that if L is smaller than V, that means if the vaccinations are outstripping the loss of immunity, then this number is less than one, because this ratio is negative. So you effectively reduce the contact rate of the pandemic by vaccination. Provided you vaccinate sufficiently quickly to outstrip the loss of immunity. Same thing happens with the underlying population. The effective population that could be potentially infected gets smaller and smaller. Therefore, the number of future cases um, becomes smaller. So when we do our third wave forecast, which I'll show you later, we make use of this observation. So 
time for the actual predictions. So let's start with a couple of other countries. We actually studied about 20 different countries, uh, USA, UK, Italy, Japan, uh, Korea, many others. And we tried to put them into different groupings, countries where uh, initially they had contained the disease and then there was a breakout, countries where they allowed the breakout gradually, like that. I won't bother you with all the details, but if you look at our paper, preprint, you will see what these 20 countries are. Now, the interesting thing is that India, as you know very well, has had two waves. Our first wave started in March 2020, peaked in September 2020, and pretty much ended in February 2021. Our second wave started around March 2021, peaked in May 2021, and except in Kerala and Maharashtra, it's over. But in the USA and UK, they have already had three waves, <clears throat> and they are now going on their fourth wave. And unlike India, where the spacing between the start of successive waves has been about a year, and the interval between the start of a wave and the peak has been about six months in the first wave, in the UK and US there have been just a few months. So one of our successes was that we have been able to explain why the USA and UK have had multiple waves, and we could show pretty conclusively that this was because initially they had witnessed what I call a false flattening of cases because the reach, when they reached their first peak, was only around 40%. So let me show you for the US, so starting 1st of March, you can sort of ignore that, that's a little bump. So you can call this the first peak, happened around end of July and the number of daily infections were around 50,000. Okay. Then there seemed to be a dip and everyone started relaxing, thought this is all over. And towards the end of uh, 2020, you know, you can see in December to January, they had a terrific rise and ignore these little dips. I, I think those are not, uh, those are probably artifacts of record keeping. Essentially, this is one large peak and you see the difference. The peak there was a quarter of a million cases per day. So approximately four times the previous peak and deaths were also that much higher. And it went down and there's a, there's a mild peak now. And I have, we have not bothered to go beyond March. There's a fourth peak, which is sort of about there. Now the US is again witnessing about 150, 160,000 cases per day but the deaths are commensurately smaller because of vaccination, okay? So in the case of UK, again, very similar story, a little early bulls, everybody was started relaxing and then things really went way up. And when they had their third wave, they had 60,000 daily cases. UK is only 5% of India, okay? So imagine 60,000 daily cases uh, for a country which is 120th of our size, and they had 1,200 deaths at this point. It went down. Now they're seeing this fourth wave, but the number of deaths has come down dramatically. Now, we have not carried this curve beyond July. They actually had around 50, 60,000 cases there. See, this blue curve stops, but actually it went way up. But interestingly, the number of deaths, which were 1,200 per day at this point, had come down to fewer than 100 at that point because the UK has achieved about 70% vaccination in their population. All right, so let's talk about India because that's what interests us. Um, so these are the predictions made for the first wave using the old, older SAIR2 model. And we got the peak more or less right. We said that the peak would come on um, 26th of September, and it actually came a little bit earlier. And things were going fairly nicely till about the middle of January, start of February. And then what happened? 
Now, so this is the flat part, and then things really took off. So what happened here is that we we knew that the previous model was not right because the previous model did not explain the sharp rise. But we could not calibrate because the parameters of the model were changing much too fast. It was only around the end of April that the model parameter stabilized, which meant that the the plot that I showed you lied very nicely on a straight line. So on the 29th of April, which is somewhere around there, we made a prediction that the peak is just about a week or 10 days away. We said the peak will be between the 5th and 8th of May. And if you can cast your mind back what the public mood was like on the 29th of April, we were on this part of the curve. So we were considered fools for predicting that the peak is nearby. As it turned out, we were right. And I think this is one of the things that um, led people to accept the Sutra model. Then what we did was we recomputed the model again on the 15th of May, once it was obvious that the peak had passed. So this is the pale blue, a uh, pale golden curve, which is computed on the 29th of April, and even it got the characteristics more or less right. And when we recomputed the model with fresh data on the 15th of May, it has been pretty much accurate. Okay. So now this curve is not going beyond June, July, and you know the reason why. I'll come to that in a minute. And at this point. So around about this point, start of July, everybody kind of conceded, including the government, including the news media, that, OK, we got the second wave more or less right. Uh, so what about the third wave prediction? So we have to ask, what causes the third wave? Well, one possibility is that we could have uh, another mutant, which is even more infectious than Delta. So if I can go back to this curve, the so-called Delta variant was first detected in the month of, of, of October last year, but it really started spreading in the month of February there in the Amravati district of Maharashtra, and then from there it spread. Okay. If we had done an adequate amount of sequencing, then we would have detected the emergence of this new variant, but that was a missed opportunity. But anyway, if there were to be a still more, inf a still more infectious mutant, we would not miss it this time because the mechanisms are in place. So that's one thing that could trigger a third wave. Another possibility is the erosion of antibodies developed during prior exposure. What do we mean by that? Well. See, all these people who got infected, say from here to there, they would be losing their antibodies. And these people who got infected in the first wave, see, in the entire first wave, the total number of uh, cases was around one crore. And in the second wave, there was an additional 2.2 crores approximately. So some of these people would be losing their antibodies. So they could again become vulnerable to reinfection, even though there is no new variant. And the third one, of course, if you look at the formula I mentioned to you, if V, the rate of vaccination, does not keep up with L, which is the rate of loss of uh, uh, immunity, then the uh, pandemic could begin to climb again. Now, we are, uh, I mean, General Connecticut has a medical background, but Professor Agrawal and I are basically uh, not medical people. Professor Agrawal is a computer scientist. I am an electrical engineer by training. So we only read the literature. And what we found is that the duration of the antibodies seems to last longer than was believed earlier. People initially thought that your uh, immunity to reinfection lasts only about six months, 
like a conventional flu, but it seems that it seems to last a lot longer. And the second point is, the vaccination rollout has been much slower than anticipated. If you look at the government forecast, they you can dig through the news releases. They were consistently predicting in the month of uh, July, six, uh, 60 lakhs per day, August, 80 lakhs per day. We're, we're nowhere close to that. We achieved 50 lakhs per day in July, 60 lakhs per day in August. Maybe if we're lucky, uh, we will achieve 80 lakhs per day in uh, September. So <clears throat> even though the vaccination rollout has been slower than anticipated, uh, when we de did the computations again, the impact doesn't seem to be significant. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about vaccination. Vaccinations don't prevent infection. What it does is to offer high protection against serious infection, and it virtually eliminates the risk of death. Okay. Now, if you look at the Indian vaccines, they before the Delta variant came along, we're claiming around 80% efficacy. And against the Delta variant, they seem to be offering around 60% protection. And Pfizer, which was initially touting 97% efficacy, against the Delta variant, it also seems to be only around 60%. And at least one study in Israel claims it is only 39%. So, Early days yet to say how effective Pfizer is against uh, the Delta variant, but doesn't seem to be any more um, protective than uh, the two vaccines that are now being widely used in India. Now, one of the points that we have to take into account while predicting the third wave is that, okay, fine, 60% efficacy, that means potentially 40% get reinfected even after vaccination. However, but those people tend to shed lower viral load and also for a shorter duration. So in our model, we just assumed that they shed 50% of the load and for 50% of the time. So if you think about the area under the curve, it's about a quarter of a, that means an unvaccinated, asymptomatically infected person, if that person sheds a viral load of V, the total amount of load shed, if the rate of shedding is a half and the duration is a half, it's simple arithmetic tells you that the total amount of virus load shed is a quarter. So we use that. And the risk of hospitalization, this is a very key statistic. Studies in many countries have shown that yes, a vaccinated person can get infected, but the risk of getting hospitalized is not even 10% of that for an unvaccinated person, okay? So, what about this waning of immunity? So, those who develop antibodies through prior exposure to infection, they do lose immunity over time and they have an increased likelihood of reinfection. But the problem is, what do you mean by reinfection? Some people say, do you test positive RT-PCR? Then they say this is too high. Others say, do you enter a hospital? Then it is too low. The truth is somewhere in between. So if you're a modeler, modeler like us, what we mean by reinfected is, are you capable of infecting others? That's all we mean by reinfection. So we ask the question, do the reinfected people infect others at the same rate as first time infected people? Now you may say, didn't you answer this question on the previous slide? No. Here I'm talking about people who get vaccinated and catch an infection. Here we're talking about people who caught the infection, recovered, did not get vaccinated and get reinfected. So what we want to know is what is their impact in terms of infecting others compared to the people who were asymptomatically infected for the first time. And similarly, are the reinfected people uh, at the same level of risk for hospitalization as the first time infected people. It seems that the answer to both of them is no, but if you want to do modeling, you can't just be uh, content with a no answer. You have to quantify. So what is the risk? Is it 50%, is it 20%, what is it? Similarly, what rate do the reinfected people infect others? So we made some approximations uh, in our models. The good news is that the predictions are not terribly sensitive to this quantification. 
So now we looked at uh, the future scenario. So what happened is that before the Delta variant came along, the beta value nationwide was around 0.23. So the, the gamma was about 0.1, so the basic reproduction ratio was 2.3. Uh, with the uh, Delta variant, and also due to the ignoring of COVID protocols, the ratio increased to 0.39 for beta. Again, if you divide by gamma, which is 0.1, the basic reproduction ratio was 3.9. So let's round it off to four. And if you remember the example I showed in a slide way back, I said the herd immunity level when R0 is four is about 75%. The good news is that the seropositivity ratio in India, that means the number of people who have been exposed to the disease now, uh, is around 67%. And in some of the states like UP and Bihar, it's closer to 80%. So that is good news. So in order to do our simulation, we assume that once the restric most restrictions are removed, uh, beta will increase still further from 0.39 to 0.44. So that means the reproduction ratio goes to 4.4. And we simulate two scenarios that there will be a further increase by the end of August just because people get COVID fatigue and they just, you know, start ignoring protocols, schools reopen, shopping malls reopen, all that kind of thing. So this you can call it the status quo scenario. And then this is the pessimistic scenario where you get a still, still faster spreading mutant where beta equals 0.75. That means your basic reproduction ratio goes up to 7.5. We have thus far not seen such a high ratio anywhere in the world, but for the purposes of simulation, we decided to do that anyway, so that it gives some sort of a highly pessimistic scenario. So here are the results. So uh, we simulated two different values, one for the epsilon equals one over 33, and one for the epsilon equals uh, one over 37. Uh, anyway, the point is that uh, there are lots of curves here. So this is the computed model and the actual data. So gold, which you can barely see, is the um, computed model. The blue, which is the actual, so right on top. Okay. And so if you take the status quo, with epsilon equals one over 33, that is the green line. Okay. And status quo with epsilon equals one over 37, that is the gold line. So the the smaller the value, that means, let's look at, uh, I always prefer to think in terms of one over epsilon. So if the one over epsilon is 33, that means that there are fewer undetected patients, so that means there's more scope for the disease to grow. If it is one over 37, that means there are 36 undetected people for every detected patient. So there's less room for the pandemic to grow. That is why the gold colored curve is below the green curve, okay? So both of these are assuming status quo, no variant. Well, what happens if you get a, a variant which is devastatingly more infectious? Then you get these two curves. And again, before, when epsilon is assumed to be uh, 1 over 37, you don't get such a large peak. If you assume it to be 1 over 33, then you get a higher peak. But the key point to note is, even in the worst possible scenario, with an extremely infectious mutant, which has never been seen anywhere thus far, the number of <clears throat> cases is still going to be under a lag. Uh, this is because of prior infection providing some immunity and vaccination compared to the peak of four lakhs in the second wave. But it is important to remember that even number of cases is not uh, a true indicator because what we're really interested in is the number of hospitalization because the true load uh, on the healthcare system comes from the number of hospitalizations. And here, uh, what we did was plotted it for just a new variant. We didn't bother with the status quo. So if epsilon equals one over uh, 37, impact is quite minimal. 
you need about 60,000 uh, oxygenated beds. And if you have 1 over 33 for the value of epsilon, you need about 1.4 lakh uh, beds with you know, oxygen and about one fifth of them need to be with ICU. So the point is that thanks to the lessons learned um, in the second wave, in any foreseeable scenario, the healthcare system should not get overwhelmed as per our predictions. Okay. Now people are throwing around very silly numbers. I saw an article in DNA which said a peak of six lakh. I mean, I, my my reaction is well, okay. If you want to make up a number, make up whatever number you want. It doesn't matter. But there is no scientific basis for that. Okay, last slide. Well, no, next to last slide. Pardon me. So here's a summary of the third wave projection. So even in the fully pessimistic scenario, uh, daily cases will not cross 1.5 to 1.7. So that is the story. Hospitalizations and deaths will be proportionately much less. So, for example, in the second wave, the deaths were approximately 1.2% of the hospitalizations. So, when we had the peak of 4,000, uh, 4 lakh, pardon me, death peaked at around 4.5 thousand per day. It won't be that high because, remember what I said, because of prior exposure and vaccination. You may get infected, you may be but the likelihood of getting hospitalized is proportionately less, and the likelihood of dying is even less, unless you don't get vaccinated. And this is a repeat of a point I mentioned earlier. Vaccination and acquired immunity do not prevent reinfection, but they prevent serious reinfection and virtually stave off death. I mentioned this already, that in the UK, they have had a fourth wave, which in terms of the number of cases, is as severe as the third wave, but their case fatality ratio has fallen by a factor of 10. Uh, India has already been through the Delta variant, but the rest of the world is just now coping with it. For example, countries like Israel and USA are feeling the effect of the Delta variant. Indonesia is another example. Now, there is an effort on in India which tracks uh, isolated virus samples from patients and does sequencing to see if there is a mutation. And thus far, mercifully, there hasn't been any new mutant. Now, this is the last slide. Everybody wants to know, what about Kerala? Now, Kerala is an interesting case. Kerala to yesterday has 31,000 cases. Maharashtra has 5,000 cases. The rest of India has 10,000 cases. So when people keep asking me, is this the start of the third wave? I say, no, it's not the India's third wave. It's Kerala's second wave, which still hasn't peaked. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the rest of India a month ago, the number of cases, excluding Kerala and Maharashtra, was 20,000. In one month, 20,000 has come down to 10,000. Uh, and there are states like a uh, large state, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Gujarat, they're all showing daily cases in the double digits. Okay. So the point is that the apparent increase in the number of uh, cases in India is solely due to Kerala. Even Maharashtra, which was around 8,000, 9,000 earlier this month, has now come down to 5,000. Kerala was at around 10,000, 10,000 became 20,000, 20,000 has become 30,000, and we have to see where it goes. Okay. So this is what I said. The rest of India has seen the end of the second wave. That's my point here. The rest of India, the number of cases came down from 20,000 to 10,000 over a one month. Very substantial decrease. Kerala is still going through its second wave. And if you actually plot the cases in Kerala, even the first wave hasn't truly ended. So what should they do? Well, right now, for them, completing the vaccination process is the only option. The uh, rest of India is in good shape, but of course, we should uh, monitor the situation closely. So that's it. Um, if people have any questions, they can ask now. Thank you very much, Professor. I see that Pulkit has raised his hand and he has question. So Pulkit, can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask? Hello, sir. How are you? Yeah, hello. Yes. 
so sir, I had uh, two questions. Firstly, like uh, while in incorporating vaccination, we are told mm -hmm. about the L and V values. So L and how V. Are calculating that L value, like uh, losing to Im immunity, the people who are losing to immunity. So how are you calculating that L value? And my second question was, why are we not are you using about these numbers? Values? Are you talking about these yes, numbers? Yes, oh, we yes, just sir. take them from the literature. We don't calculate them because there are a lot of studies. There are some studies from Italy, one from Denmark, in fact, two from Denmark, uh, one from US, so like that. We just look at all of these uh, studies that are reported in the literature and just average them. In India, we are only just now beginning to do our own longitudinal studies because the, to compute these kinds of numbers, you have to take a bunch of people and follow them over a period of several months. You cannot rush the process. So for now, we are just going with the international studies. Uh, we hope over time we'll replace them with um, Indian studies. Okay, what's your second question? Okay, okay, sir. And second question was, why are we not using two different variables for people who have been vaccinated singly and doubly? Like we can have use for single dose V1 and uh, double dose V2 rather than singly using V. Yeah, but all, all that does is that you all you have, so think about V1 of T and V2 of T. The relative proportion of V1 and V2 changes over time as people get one dose and two doses. So you just take a blended average that gives you a V. Remember, I kept saying when I presented this slide, V is not constant. V is actually a function of time. So you could just think about V as a blended average of the people who have one dose and two doses. So then it's like a moving uh, indicator of what fraction of the people have gained immunity. Right? So you don't actually gain anything by introducing more and more categories. OK, so thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Pulkit. Um, taking the prerogative of the convener, I, I have two questions. OK. One is that the, um, the RT-PCR, which is basically we rely upon the test positive indicator, that itself is only 80% accurate. That's so, not what my friends tell me. The one that's unreliable is the rapid antigen test. Because, uh, I mean, I've talked to various people who run these labs. They say that it, it's both sensitivity and specificity are in the high 90s. Okay. I think this 80th number is quoted by people amazingly to malign their RT-PCR. But the people that I talk to don't tell me that. But the rapid antigen test is um, more troublesome because it's a false positive ratio is essentially zero. So that means if you are shown positive, you are definitely positive. But the false negative is about 30%. So you could be positive, but with a probability of 0.3, you are shown as negative, which means that the true, so if a state is betting on rapid antigen test to the exclusion of rapid antigen, then the true number of cases is going to be approximately 40% more than the number of positive cases. So where does this 40% come from? Just one divided by 0 0.7 because the false negative ratio is 30%, right? Anyway, so please go ahead with your question. Yeah, that, that, that answers my question. So that's one. Second is uh, about the death rate or the death uh, prediction of your model. Um, See, the death rate we basically decided not to predict because death is a function of so many other factors that are not within the purview of modeling. I'm going to be a little bit caustic. Okay. How do you model the fact that people were uh, holding life-saving drugs and selling them on the black market? How do you model the fact that VVIPs were booking bets in their name in case they became sick and thereby artificially created a shortage of beds. How do you model the fact that uh, people were uh, stealing oxygen cylinders and keeping them at home? All of these contribute to the, the death ratio. So we decided not to go there at all. That's why we just say R is for removed, recovered plus death. So we don't go there at all trying to predict the death rate. Now, I should tell you one more thing. There are a whole bunch of people who are pulling various bizarre numbers out of thin air. 
saying that India is undercounting by factor of 8, 10, 20, I don't know, they make up whatever number they feel like. One person has shared a, a manuscript with me and Professor Agrawal, according to his calculations, India is undercounting anywhere between 1.5 to 2 times and the corresponding ratio is about 1.2 to 1.5 times for the US. For example, just yesterday, New York State admitted that they undercounted by about 20%. See, the, the people who are uh, having fun pulling out all these weird numbers, what they're saying is that what they call the CR, the Central Registry System, the number of deaths reported are going up by about 8 or 10% every year. So they call all these extra deaths as due to coronavirus. But what they don't understand is that a lot of these uh, extra reported deaths are just due to better compliance. So for example, if you take a state like Bihar or Andhra Pradesh, two states for which we know the numbers, the number of reported deaths as per the central registry system has climbed by between 8 to 10 percent for the last two, three years. Okay. Now, let me be very blunt and say, one would have to be a fool to think that the number of people who died in Andhra Pradesh and in Bihar grew by 8 to 10 percent per year. No. It just means that it grew at the same rate as the general population, which is about 1.5 percent, and the differential is due to better compliance. So when people don't account for better reporting uh, as accounting for a significant part of the increase in reported deaths, then I say to myself, well, these people are not serious. So I just ignore all these things. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I see that there's one more question from our audience, uh, Drashti Kher. Drashti, can you please unmute yourself and ask this question? Or you want me to read it out? Uh, there's a question, uh, which I will read it out. It's from the student uh, Kher Drishti. Can this model show the number of future waves coming in near future of two years? Yeah, you can in the sense that, let's go back to the UK. So both in the case of US here, what precipitated this wave? It's because at this point, the reach was only around 40%. So even though it looked like the number of cases had peaked because Rho was only 0.4, that means 60% of the population was beyond the reach of the pandemic. So we could forecast the future wave. Same was true in the UK. Here also the Rho was around 0.5. And same was also true in Japan, by the way. Uh, so we can forecast the future peak. Now in India, the reach is around 0.88. That means around 88% of the people have already been exposed, which is why a future peak due to expansion of reach is very unlikely. The only thing that would cause a future wave uh, in India is a much more virulent mutant, not expanding reach of the pandemic. Thank you. Ushmita Parikh, can you please unmute yourself or if you're not able to, then I will read it out, your question. Um, yeah, hello, good evening, sir. So uh, my question is this. So uh, the Sutra model, when you discussed, you uh, showed how uh, the two integral terms that were basically uh, transforming the data non-linearly and uh, how the linear relationship between them had uh, important role in identifying phases and that basically contributes to the uh, success of uh, the sutra model uh, yeah. i want to know what thought went into identification of this uh, relationship as it looks a little bit complex to me uh, how no, would you no, if this, reach that conclusion if, if this looks complex to you i think you will find the paper even more complex essentially what you have to do is to uh, understand that there is an, so if you look at where are the equations, yeah, yeah, if you look at these equations, as I said, there's a minus sign missing there, but leave that aside. Uh, these are basically bilinear equations. They're nonlinear, but a special type of nonlinearity. 
because you never have a square, you just have product of two terms. And this part, of course, is completely linear, this exponential decay. This part is exponential decay, right? So it's not that bad. So what you have to do is to remove the transient part that comes from this exponential decay here, and then focus on the bilinear part. And that's what gives you uh, this relationship. So okay. we have a preprint in archive. You can read that. And that gives you the full derivation. OK. Yeah, there are some listeners who wanted to have the paper. I will have them mailed to the interested readers with the preprint. No, no, no. They can, they, can, they can go to my website uh, on IIT Hyderabad. It's there on my, on my research page. So there's a oh. link to the archive reprint, uh, preprint, I should say, on my research page. That's good. So if there are any, uh, any other questions, people may either raise your hand or please type it. And if there are none, then I take this opportunity to thank Professor Vidya Sagar to have agreed to our request and to have spent his valuable time in delivering this lecture. Ever since the pandemic, there has been a lot of, um, as you say, pulling out of the thin air, various models, various numbers. But at least we have today got to hear it from the horse's mouth, if I may say so, in a metaphorical sense, that we got a clear picture of what's uh, what has been the mathematical assessment of this pandemic and what we have in our store for the future. So I, on behalf of my institute, as well as my personal behalf, and uh, all my colleagues and students, thank you immensely once again for having spent your time and having delivered the no lecture. Problem. Thank you. And uh, we would definitely love to hear you more in the future, and I'm sure you would accept our request to deliver more lectures 